Hello, everyone, and welcome to our panel event today discussing resources for tenants and a look at what we are advocating for in this year's budget around housing and protections for renters. My name is Natasha Salgado, pronouns she, hers, ella, and I am a community organizer with Logan Heights CDC and a member of the Housing and Tenants Rights Working Group, um, along with other partner organizations. Um, those partners include City Heights Community Development Corporation, the San Diego LGBT Community Center, Parent Voices, Voices ACE, um, Partnership for the Advancement of New Americans, PANA, um, and the San Diego Tenants Union. Um, our working group believes that housing is a human right, not a commodity to be bought and sold for profit. Um, Pre-COVID, 53% of renters in the city of San Diego were housing burdened. Um, every individual and family in San Diego should have access to stable housing that is healthy, safe, and affordable. Today's webinar is hosted by the Community Budget Alliance, also known as CBA. We are a coalition of over 25 community labor and faith-based organizations and work every day towards um, advancing a people's budget within the city of San Diego, specifically by standing up for equitable public investment that will increase community wealth, health, and justice for all, especially for communities of color. We believe that the city can and must simultaneously provide vital services and programs invest in high quality infrastructure and use public dollars to support good jobs. By building power locally, we can strengthen our cities and determine our futures. I will now turn it over to Kat with San Diego Tenants Union to introduce the next section of today's webinar. Kat. Thank you so much, Natasha. Um, so as uh, Natasha was saying, my name is Kat. I'm with San Diego Tenants Union. Um, I actually, I would like, let me message Grace. I wanna make sure that um, I have the PowerPoint that is available. Um, I think you just wanna introduce Jim. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much, Grace. Um, yes, so we have an amazing speaker today. Uh, is the author of an amazing book that talks about the gentrification in the tourism industry in Southern California. Um, it's called Under the Perfect Sun, and they're going to be talking about the history of uh, San Diego, Southern California. Please uh, welcome Jim Miller. Hi, everybody. Um, so when Everybody asked me to come tonight. Um, I preface it by saying I'm not an expert at all on housing, you know, but I can talk a little bit about the history of power, um, racial and class segregation in San Diego and kind of how we got to the point where you need a tenants rights struggle in the city of San Diego. So what I'm going to do very briefly uh, this evening is just talk a little bit, um, drawing on some stuff from Under the Perfect Sun, you know, about, you know, the kind of history about how San Diego was formed as a city. Um, and then, you know, um, talk a little bit about some current uh, forces driving gentrification and, 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 and give you all some, some numbers that sort of show how stark the issue um, that ordinary, you know, working people face when they're trying to buy or rent in the city. So, so in Under the Perfect Sun, you know, I, I, I start with this sentence, perhaps no other urban space embodies the logic of the theme park more than America's finest city, right? And, and really there, you know, the, the, the idea here is that, you know, we've got the postcard of San Diego, the kind of Baywatch stereotype, but as all of us on this uh, Zoom here tonight know, you know, the lives of ordinary people in San Diego are, are, are quite different. So the overall effect of the theme park city is to replace a narrative of class division or racial division and labor squabbles with a space that as scholar Susan Davis says is as non-conflictual as possible. Um, so San Diego's boosters have always consciously sought to avoid the importation of undesirable elements. And if that failed to eliminate them by any means necessary. Nonetheless, despite San Diego's history of social Darwinist city planning, chamber of commerce racism, 
reactionary vigilantism and open class war, rebellions have, have, have cracked through the glossy veneer of the theme park, if only to be brutally suppressed. The subaltern history of rebellion in San Diego has centered around free speech, the use of public space, the rights of workers and people of color, which have um, been tolerated only as long as they didn't interfere with the boosters' plans for the city or their efforts to market America's finest city as a non-conflictual space suitable for affluent Anglos as either migrants or tourists. And I think really the struggle, you know, of uh, tenants and renters in San Diego kind of fits that um, that that uh, billing, you know. But a, a little bit of, of background history on kind of how the city space and and, and housing landscape was formed. And this is from a, a dissertation, not a published book, you know, um, in the early '70s. Uh, so as as Leroy Harris notes in the other side of the freeway, a study of settlement patterns of Negroes and Mexican Americans in San Diego, California. Throughout its history as an American city, San Diego has contained a numerically and proportionally smaller number of Negroes and Mexican Americans than most other large American cities. And he wrote this in the you know the very early '70s, and and, and it I think helps set the stage for what we see today. In addition to the overt social and economic discrimination faced by people of color in San Diego with regard to employment, civil rights, and, and other aspects of life, the persistent efforts of realtors have also stood in their way. As Harris's study shows, restrictive covenants and real estate deeds and the active role of real estate agents in the formation of segregated housing patterns were a strong force in creating a segregated San Diego. Indeed, as late as 1964, the San Diego Realty Board lobbied hard against the Rumford Act, California's fair housing law, and actively campaigned to have it annulled through a ballot proposition. The Committee for Home Protection spearheaded the anti-Rumford Act drive. Their public relations consultant was William Shear, an ultra conservative former Oceanside newspaper publisher, then administrative assistant for the Republican Assemblyman Richard Barnes of San Diego. Shear also wrote for the segregationist journal The Citizen, arguing that the GOP could win national elections if it could kick free of the ball and chain of integration and helped frame the anti-Rumford fight as a defense of property rights and freedom of choice. The California Real Estate Association may have been embarrassed at the time by the re support it received from the American Nazi party members who marched outside the El, Cor or El Cortez Hotel where they met in 1963. But when the realtors voted overwhelmingly to fight against the Rumford Act and all future legislation against housing discrimination, they were marching in lockstep with the fascists. Proposition 14, which would have overturned the Rumford Fair Housing Act passed with a large majority in the state by more than, uh, and by the more than two thirds in San Diego County. If not for the California Supreme Court, the right would have won. So you have you know, a pretty stark example there of, of a connection between you know, controlling who has access to fair housing in San Diego and, and a fairly overt um, racist ideology you know, um, quite recently, historically in the city's history. Um, but San Diego wasn't built on Anglo-Saxonism alone, right? Um, so central to the strategy of shaping the space of San Diego and who lives in San Diego was San Diego's quest to bring the Navy, right? And this is something that lots of people who live here don't know. As Abraham Schrag documents in his intensive study of San Diego's obsession with the Navy, Boosters and Blue Jackets, the Civic Culture of Militarism in San Diego, 1900 to 1945, city boosters saw the Navy as an answer to their dreams because as the union put it, men of that establishment were of a high class, 
the Navy didn't just bring in large amounts of federal money. The boosters believed that there were no radicals or scurrious industrial workers of the world types in the Navy, nor petty crooks as well. And the pre-World War II Navy was also exclusively white in its racial comp composition. So thanks to the relentless efforts of San Diego's boosters, along with the political savvy of Congressman William Kettner, the plan succeeded. And for the early part of our history, the military you know, succeeded in helping to make the Navy San Diego um, a wider city without a large industrial working class. Of course, once the armed forces are desegregated, this flips on its head and then and the military starts to bring, you know, a different kind of, of demographic to the city. Um, but I think it's important to acknowledge, you know, um, that, you know, the role that played, you know, in the formation of, of San Diego um, as, as the city evolved. Um, you know, so really when you look at today, you know, you have this gap between a primarily white group of affluent professionals and a growing low wage service sector, right? You know, and it's this history that I've just outlined that kind of helps set the you know, set, set the table, you know, for the contemporary in inequities that we see in this um, city. So seen in this light, the redevelopment of downtown into an entertainment complex for affluent consumers dotted with new condos selling for close to a million dollars in many cases, it's just the latest installment of the same old story of booster class war fought from the top down. San Diego is no longer the lily white Navy tourist town it was for most of its history, um, but it remains clear that the city's elite are trying hard to maintain um, the city's theme park image. Um, so, so that's, some of the history that's in Under the Perfect Sun about kind of the, you know, the way in which the city's elite, the city's boosters have tried to shape who San Diego was for and who was welcome in San Diego. Um, recently um, in the OB rag, I, I wrote a, a piece that was about, a, a, you know, a, a contemporary form of gentrification that's happening right now before our eyes downtown that kind of, I think, adds, you know, uh, you know, ammunition to that earlier argument about like the kind of city that the boosters promote. So, so here I, I note that recently the city council voted to roll out the red carpet for the tech industry. So if San Francisco had a tech bro problem, you know, that priced half the city out of the city, San Diego is looking to create its own. As, KB, as KPBS reported, a downtown San Diego's Horton Plaza is on its way to becoming a high tech, uh, a high tech hub. The city of uh, San Diego City Council voted unanimously to approve a proposal um, from Los Angeles-based Stockdale Partners to turn the mall into a mixed-use center called the Campus at Horton. Last August, Forbes published a piece on how this Los Angeles-based opportunistic real estate investor bought what they called the beleaguered Horton Plaza, which was suffering from, and this is a quote, a significant homeless presence in the adjacent home Horton Plaza Park, locally dubbed Homeless Plaza, and was aiming to save our endangered urban core with its bid to transform San Diego's central business district into a tech hub by leveraging the high percentage of millennials living in the city and the concentration of life science companies operating in the suburbs. The model, you guessed it, San Francisco and other transformed metropolises. A high density project like the campus at Horton could bring thousands of jobs downtown to lift up the surrounding neighborhoods similar to the development that's occurred in San Francisco's Trans Bay District, Chicago's West Loop and Scottsdale's Old Town. So as you see here, the rhetoric of gentrification is always the same. Boosters describe targeted areas as blighted, homeless infested urban spaces in need of salvation brought to you by transforming the neighborhood into an employment and entertainment zone for largely affluent white consumers. Making urban spaces safe and attractive for the privileged is always the end game. And the achievement of this goal is seen as a de facto evidence of progress in the city. Um, and as somebody who lived in the 
area surrounding downtown for uh, many years watching this happen you know i think it's it's uh it remarkable one more piece of this and then I'll, I'll wrap up with a couple um examples you know of you know kind of what the number what numbers we're looking at and kind of who owns san diego today um you can see this in the way the boosters of the campus at horton project describe how the mall was transformed uh how the mall transformed the gas lamp in the 1980s in a kpbs interview a lot of people said you're never going to clean that up it's going to have peep shows it's going to have adult theaters it's going to have those dive bars i think that changed and we're okay with that then we saw single family homes in little italy and yeah i miss them the changes happened there were high rises in some of the community character yeah that's changed but no one would complain about how vibrant it is now how great a place it is to be a resident as well as a visitor so i say that's why you should give us a chance right and of course some of those same purveyors you know, um, now want to create an idea district, uh, you know, that will bring even more tech in the area around the courtyard in uh, downtown San Diego. So really what you see here, you know, is this whole effort to take areas that were previously working class areas where there were single room occupancy hotels or working class neighborhoods where sadly all the small houses have to get pushed out of little italy or the east village you know in the service of making san diego better which for the average working class person in the city means no one can afford to live there um, and you see this again and again in the city and i think you see a lot of these pressures happening now in barrio logan so really, what are the numbers here, you know, um, right now? Well, right now in San Diego, it takes a minimum annual household income of $131,000 to qualify to buy a house in San Diego. And that's more than double the $54,000 needed nationwide, right? So when you look at this, 29% of households can afford to purchase a median priced home here compared to 31% in California and 56% nationwide. So the answer is who can afford to live here and buy a house? The vast majority of people cannot is the answer. Um, in terms of who owns rentals, the biggest 10 landlords in San Diego County control 23% of the 182,000 plus units um, you know, that exist and San Diego's top 20 companies control more than one quarter of the market, right? You know, so that means, you know, there is a, a, a heavy concentration of ownership in a small number of people. So, for example, in the neighborhood that I live, Golden Hill, you know, uh, most people know that it's a very small number of people who own the vast majority of rentals in the entire neighborhood. Um, and, you know, what's happening recently, you know, in my, my last minute or so here, well, you know, I, I, I found this from just a couple of years ago to, to bring to you today when I was preparing. And here the number said home prices across the county are up by, you know, 11.6%, the highest in more than six years. And this was from 12-31-2020. Um, um, and then just today, when I was looking at the news in the LA Times, they noted that now San Diego's home prices are at an old, uh, at an all time high, up by more than 14.6% uh, in the medium house housing cost in San Diego is $672,000, which is um, remarkable. And the same report from KPBS, you know, reports that um, what's happened during the pandemic is a huge explosion, you know, of, of uh, value and home ownership and property ownership for the top 20% of people in the city, while the bottom 20% of people in the city, and that's both homeowners and renters, you know, are seeing an incredible amount of housing insecurity, people being foreclosed on, people being uh, unable to afford rent. So um, really what, you know, we're, situation we're seeing today is a situation where the question, which has been the question for many years now in the city is becoming intensified, which is, you know, um, how in the world can 
the average working person in San Diego afford to buy a house? Um, and even more importantly, you know, how many people are going to be able to afford to rent if we recruit this huge amount of tech workers, which will push the rents even further than they are right now? Will we be San Francisco in the making is the question. So I'll stop with that and um, you know, leave it to the next speaker. Thanks for your time. Thank you so much, Jim. You know, I'm so honored that you're able to join us to give a historic context. Um, so, uh, well, it just goes into now, I, please pardon me, would I have to share my screen? I just wanna make sure I have this right. Uh, beautiful cat. It's be okay. Uh, I'm wondering because there's a PowerPoint I want people to see. And basically, it's going to be talking about what are the tenant protections before 2020. And you know what? It's kind of a, a trick question. Um, there really isn't much. Um, <laughs> so to get into it, uh, generally, landlords did not have to give a reason to evict tenants um, in San Diego has just caused protections, uh, reasons why a tenant can be evicted, but only after you have been a tenant for two years. And most tenants don't even know if they have this protection. So um, a huge um, divide um, that's regarding education, awareness, um, advocates at, in the community. So I think it's really important to address, you know, what we're doing on the ground and you know, I would like to hand this over to somebody who I consider a mentor. Um, she is fabulous. She has been in, um, uh, an integral role in uh, pushing forward uh, what is needed in San Diego. And this is from Grace with um, Grace from ACE. Hello everyone. And, you know, just hearing um, Jim and, you know, Kat who from the Tenants Union has been on the ground for like multiple years. Um, one thing to raise up is that prior to the pandemic and prior to 2020, most tenants did not have rights. Um, and you combine that with our inability to um, buy a home and also not having protections, it be coming into the pandemic made it a very different thing. Can you move on to the next slide? So as Kat mentioned, and I think many of us are aware, um, and if you're not, I'm glad you're here today, that because San Diego as, as a region is probably one of the bigger regions in California that does, have, does not have tenant protections. And whether you support rent control or not, whether you support tenant protections or not, what that comes with aside from protections are also infrastructure. Um, meaning access to legal representation, access to um, education, knowing exactly where to go and what to do when a tenant, um, when a landlord abuses your rights. So one of the key problems that we're seeing is most tenants don't know their rights. Um, if I'm telling you that in, at the beginning of 2020, there was a new statewide protection um, one of three in the entire country that gives us very limited rights. Um, that would be news to you. And that's a, that's a problem here in San Diego. Um, AB 1482, um, after multiple years of fighting on the statewide level, provides some protections around how high your landlord can raise your rent in a year and also, and also how they can evict you. Um, Kat mentioned earlier that, you know, prior to 2020, a landlord didn't have to give a reason. Um, the city of San Diego has some form of protection, just cause, meaning that there has to be real reasons why a landlord is um, evicting you, but those don't, you don't get protected until you've been a tenant for two years. But what good is a law if you don't know that you have a protection and what good is the law if no one is actually paying attention to it? Another thing that for right now, um, especially during the pandemic, is that there have been many 
um, attempts to protect tenants who are unable to pay their rent because of COVID-19. One of them, as you might hear, I've heard, is SB 91. So it's also very narrow and also provides very limited protections. Um, this protects tenants um, against evictions related to non-payment of rent due to COVID-19. So it doesn't stop all evictions. It only um, prevents evictions or your landlord from filing if you can't pay if you've been financially impacted by COVID-19. Um, this bill also comes with um, rental assistance, which also, you know, as if you've heard that the city, um, the county of San Diego, as well as Chula Vista, all over the state, people are applying for rental assistance. And if you haven't, um, this is for back payment of rent. Um, and towards the end, we'll let people know what those resources are. But it's one part of, it's one tool in a big toolbox that every tenant should have. Um, te you know, landlords, unfortunately, what we see is that they're using loopholes um, to still evict tenants. And a lot of this is because there is no real significant rent control. So landlords want to flip property. They want to be able to raise the rent. Um, and they don't even want to deal with the paperwork oftentimes when it comes to um, these, this rental assistance. Um, next slide. So as I mentioned, like San Diego itself doesn't have a lot of significant protections and it shows. Um, this was an article from February, um, actually a news broadcast that despite like the statewide moratorium, um, nearly a thousand San Diego's and uh, San Diegans were evicted last year during the pandemic. The goal of the moratorium was to make sure that we were safe and healthy, right? Because we know that when someone gets evicted, they are likely to either live in their car or double up and live in overcrowded situations. And a lot of you know the protections we have now, like shelter in place, these moratoriums, the goal is to keep, um, to keep the COVID numbers low so that we're not exposed. But despite all those attempts to protect, we see weaknesses. And one of them um, is that we only have a statewide protection and we're still seeing people being kicked out on the street during this time. Um, can you move on to the next slide? So here's just an example of how San Diego, um, in, in terms of its numbers, the majority of the evictions were coming from the city of San Diego. Um, we are, need to be in a place where this should be minimal, right? People can't pay their rent. Um, there are no jobs out there and you really can't squeeze blood from a rock. Um, where we are as we move forward is that there are models and there are other parts of the state that are doing so much better when it comes to protecting tenants. I am gonna ask people to put in the chat, um, Alameda County has a moratorium that's local. Um, in San Diego, we had nearly a thousand, and this is from February, so those numbers might even be higher now. Could anyone take a guess how many evictions the county of Alameda, where the city of Oakland is, how many evictions that county had? All right, um, the answer is eight. San Diego as a county had nearly a thousand and most likely over a thousand now. And um, the county of Alameda had eight evictions. Um, it is pretty um, stark evidence. <laughs> like what, is, are, what are they doing versus what are we doing here in San Diego? And the reality is, is that Oakland, the county of Alameda already has strong tenant protections and they went above and beyond as a region to come up with stronger moratoriums to ensure the health and safety of its community. Um, I think that's done for those slides. But aside from the numbers, the one thing that people really need to hear and understand is like, what's the impact on people, right? Um, I can show you 
data and numbers all day, but what's real are, you know, the parents, the families, the seniors who don't know what their rights are, um, are really being victimized during this time, and also are just being told that they have no rights or, or not knowing where to access things. And I do want to lift up one of our um, leaders at ACE. ACE is a community organization, and we organize um, tenants, working class families to really push for policies that improve the lives of all our communities. And I'd love to introduce, um, before we introduce um, Patricia Mendoza, we do want to show um, a video quickly on Vice about just you know what her struggle is but also hear from Patricia about a message of what we need to do as a community to really step up and change things. So I don't know if we're able to show the video. This is my daughter's room. This is the room me and my son share. We sleep together. It's not that big, but it's it's our home. I was able to afford it before the pandemic. Since the pandemic started, I've had three landlords and three 60-day eviction notices. My first landlord eviction was June 30th, 2020. Uh, my second landlord was September 28th. Uh, 2020, and yesterday's 60-day notice eviction, um, I'm supposed to be out now, April 10th. Patricia Mendoza is one of over 30 million Americans who've been at risk of eviction in the country's most severe housing crisis since the Great Depression. That's according to the National Low-Income Housing Coalition. This is the checkers game where grandson and granddad will bond. This is the kitchen where the new boyfriend will unofficially become family. These are the verbal vacation homes waiting for your family. Why aren't you the landlord? Yes, you. Why aren't you the landlord? Every day you go to and from work and you look up and you see apartment buildings, self-storage facilities, office buildings, shopping centers, and I bet at times what's going through your mind is what would it be like if I owned that commercial property? What would yeah. the cash flow be? How could it speed up my retirement? We or probably can um, skip this part, Jean-Louis. I Jean understand how to buy that commercial property. You know the one. The one where you work in and you see the landlord every day and he's just an average person. How did he do that? How can I be like him? Well, what's stopping you? Well, if what's stopping you is you need a place to begin, I have a solution. It's right here in my new... Mendoza, who's a single mom, has lived in her apartment for almost four years and says before COVID, she always paid rent on time. Do double plates. I was working at a non-emergency medical transportation company. I would take disabled patients to their doctor appointments. April 5th was the day I actually got laid off, so it was hard. You see, you're in class. Except good morning, and then my name. Oh. I don't have savings to fall back on. I applied for unemployment. Unemployment didn't come in till June. I hadn't paid. April, May, or June rent. Not only am I afraid of getting evicted, I'm afraid of the back debt. Since you're on break right now, can I eat? I'm gonna owe $6,875 that I don't know where it's gonna come from. I've had seven asthma attacks since March, and I know that's due to anxiety and stress. We like almond breeze, huh? But then we have to eat the regular milk when we're low on funds. I can't just go out there and find another job. I can't work the front lines. Because what if I get sick? Who will take care of my kids? Working moms have had a uniquely difficult time in the pandemic. 
The service sector, which includes restaurants, hotels, and salons, employs about 43% of all women, but only about 25% of all men. The industry has been hit hard by shutdowns. So thank you so much. And, you know, we're in San Diego. It's pretty amazing that we can have a tenant who um, and all our members and all tenants have that this power to be able to tell their story. And um, Patricia, I'd like to call on Patricia Mendoza, one of our ACE leaders, um, since that video has come out um, and just pretty much her journey and why we have to step up and fight back. So Patricia, are you ready to um, tell your story and why we have to organize? <laughs> yeah, I'm ready. Um, that's me. That's me in that video. I'm Patricia Mendoza. I'm the one that has really been hit hard. Um, and I continue to fight because of my blessings. These are my blessings and this is why I fight. You know, we don't ask for, for luxury. We don't ask for a mansion. We just want what's right. And what's right is, I, I'm trying to do everything that is possible. I mean, I'm sorry, I know I'm teary, but every time I see a story of myself, it's the love, it's, it's, it's what's happening to me. It's, I've been through it all. You name it and I'll say, yeah, I've been through it. My internet cord for my kids long, you know, distant learning school, cut off. Uh, water, shut off. Electricity, changed to the owner's name. Um, anything, you name it, I've been through it. And it's been the hardest thing because, you know, because I have kids. Maybe if I was by myself, it wouldn't hurt as much. But I'm not the only one hurting. My kids are hurting. My children are hurting. And they see I lose sleep. You know, I cry. If you see those pictures when I was working, my hair was dyed. I didn't have this. I didn't have this. You know, um, it's really hard. And this is why I continue to fight. I continue to fight because our children are our future. Our children are our future. And if I don't teach my kids what's right from wrong, then who is? Um, you, like I said, you name it, I've been through it. I, I'm not gonna stop fighting. I will never, I will never stop fighting because I'm just an ordinary mom that wants the best for her children. That's all I want. You know, I've been fighting this battle since last year for rent relief. I've been fighting this, you know, this rent relief for a while now and and for a year. I'm not gonna lie, for a year. And it's been the hardest thing for me, but you know what? I learned, I learned my rights. I learned that I'm doing everything possible to get that man his money. You know, even if it's 80%, 80 is better than nothing. You know, you keep your 80 and I keep my kids safe. And, and, and that to me would, would mean the world, you know, and, and this is why I continue to fight. That's why I ask you and I urge all of you. And I know there's good landlords out there. Don't get me wrong. I understand there's good landlords out there and I understand that you want your money. But when you want your money so much to where you don't want your money, you just want me and my children out, what are you sending me and my children? You're setting me up for failure. Why? Because you know why? Because I don't have a steady income. Because I don't have a job. Because $48 a week from unemployment is not going to pay my bills. It's not going to pay my rent. It's not. So... What happens to me and my children? We live out of a van or we go to a shelter that, how can I do this to my children? I, I feel like I'm gonna fail as a mother and I shouldn't. 
You know, this pandemic has been worse, has been worse, has been the, the worst thing that's ever happened to me. And I thought that my divorce was bad. My divorce was nothing. My divorce was nothing compared to this. Because, yeah, my divorce, you know, it got me depressed. But you know what? I had two blessings. I had two blessings. I still had to, you know what I mean? I still have to come up. As a woman, I still have to come up. You know what? He's not going to bring me down. But this pandemic, I didn't cause this. This was not my fault or my children's fault. So how do I overcome this? How do I overcome? How do I, how do I tell my kids? You know, it's going to be okay when I've been fighting for this run relief and then your owner doesn't want to accept it. How? What happens? But come, but he says, come July, I'm going to take you to court for all the unpaid rent. You know, you know that I can't afford that. You know, I can barely, I, I can't even afford your rent right now. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm doing this rent relief application and you don't want to accept it. What happens to us? What happens to, to mothers, to fathers, to families like us? Who helps us at the end? That's why I continue to fight. This is why I continue to fight. Our children are our future. And yeah. we need to fight for them. What would you, um, Patricia, what would you tell tenants now in city of San Diego? What are the steps to take in order to win? You know, find help. Find ACE, find the tenants union, find an organization that can help you. You know why? Because there is help. Educate yourselves. We A, you know, let me tell you something. When we lose, when they, when we lose our fear, they lose their power. We, we are stronger together. So we need to know our rights. We have meetings every Friday, every Friday, and they're know your rights. And you know what? That has taught me so much, so much to where they can come and they've been coming to my door, knocking on my door and trying to intimidate me and my children. You know who cries? I know I'm crying now, but you know who cries? You're trying to hurt me. You're not hurting me. You're hurting my children. You're intimidating my children because they're not in the meetings where, where I'm at. They're not there. It's me. So then I have to educate my kids on how, you know, it's going to be okay, baby. It's going to be okay. When we lose our fear, they lose their power. Remember that. That's the strongest thing I can advocate right now. Because our children are our future. Regardless if we live in Imperial Beach, National City, Chula Vista, Oakland, Sacramento, you know what? And a really high La Jolla our children are our future and we need to take care of them. So thank you so much, Patricia. And I know that like she gets, and it makes sense. Like it, this is a hard thing for a lot of families and a lot of tenants who feel like we've never had anything. How do we move forward? But the next part of this um, panel is to really talk about like, what the hell do we need to do now, right? Um, we're not going to take it. We're ready to fight. And I'm going to introduce Blake about what, what we need to do as a community, as tenants, as supporters, if we want to make change in our community and change in the city of San Diego. We know what the problem is. So, Blake, take it away. Uh, thank you, Grace. And, and thank you, Patricia. I, you know, I really appreciate you it's clearly not easy, you know, to, to, to tell your story and, and, and share what your experience has been throughout this pandemic. But I really appreciate you being a voice, not just for yourself and fighting, not just for your family. Um, but knowing that there are other families who are in this situation and they don't have to be, um, is the frustrating part. If our elected officials mobilize to to protect folks, we could avoid some of the some of what you've been going through. And um, but I, I really am grateful for you sharing your voice and 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 you know reclaiming your power in this situation. Um, so so thank you, uh, I appreciate it. Um, so yeah, so as as Grace mentioned, we we want to try to outline 
you know, what's possible, you know, moving forward, like what should we be striving for in San Diego uh, to create the type of climate um, that ensures we have what we need, that, that everyone has, has housing. Um, and so, uh, jean I'm hoping you can pull up the, the slides for this next part. But I wanted to start by just asking folks a couple questions. Thanks, jean and we can go to the next slide. Um, so if folks want to answer this question in the chat, uh, I'd, I'd appreciate it. What, is it. what does it mean to you to have safe and stable housing? What, 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 do that, what does that mean, safe and stable housing? I'll give a couple, couple seconds for folks to, to share what safe and stable housing means to them. Or just feel free to consider, ponder this question on your own. Um, I'd love to see some of your thoughts, but it's not required for us to move forward. Okay. Annette says, peace. Adina is sharing, knowing that I can afford my apartment even when a crisis comes up. Yeah. Um, Katie says the basis for all other security. Yeah, um, th that's good, Katie. Uh, I think something you know we we try to push the narrative that public safety is is more than just law enforcement. Um, public safety is safe and stable housing. Uh, Nelida sharing paz, salud mental, cero estrés, seguridad para la familia, peace, mental health no stress and security for the family. Um, yeah, I, I agree, Nalita, especially the zero stress part. Um, stress is, is, is really insidious and, and has negative impacts on our health. And I think as Patricia was sharing, um, you know, Patricia, I could feel that stress that not having safe and stable housing has caused you over the last year. Um, Karen is saying, knowing that I don't have to be afraid about where we will live. Yeah, the, the absence of fear. And Yolanda shares just feeling safe and having the security that we have a roof for our families. Dory is mentioning safe and healthy housing, not having to live in housing that negatively impacts health because it's the only affordable option. Yeah, uh, things, you know, a home that's free of mold, asbestos, uh, pests. Uh, and Karen, again, the, the family element, knowing that your children uh, are not afraid, knowing that they're safe, knowing that there's no uncertainty. Um, Emily, yeah, safe, no bugs, safe, yeah, uh, you know, air quality, things aren't broken, secure, um, and stable. Uh, yeah, defining those things separately, stable being not having to worry about getting suddenly uh, evicted or removed from your home because your landlord decides one day. Um, thanks, Brittany, for, for raising up um, uh, accessibility for folks with, with disabilities to have structural accessibility for their homes. Yeah. All right, feel free to keep putting some more things in the chat, but we're gonna go ahead and move to the next slide. Um, it's gonna build on that, on that question. Uh, so now that we've defined safe and stable housing, what do we need? locally in San Diego to ensure everyone has access to safe and stable housing. Um, and again, so to make sure that everyone has access to a zero stress living environment, a secure living environment, housing they know they can afford, they know if something happens, you know, Adina mentioned a crisis, knowing if you lose your job, um, if a pandemic happens, um, knowing that you'll still be able to keep your home What do we need to, to ensure that everyone has access to that, that type of housing that we've just collectively defined? This one's a little bit trickier, I think, um, thinking about what we need, especially in a, in a place like San Diego, where um, I think Jim outlined it's a city that has historically been made in the image that a, a select group um, wants it to be. Uh, and, and as Grace mentioned, even the comparison to Alameda, you know, that's a place that mobilized quickly to ensure that evictions were prevented and we don't, uh, we didn't have that locally. Um, 
So I'm not seeing any, uh, it's, it's okay. Um, if you just kind of sit and chew on this question, cause we're going to answer this, um, as we move forward, uh, Brittany, Brittany shares a, a friendlier San Diego housing commission, uh, and a, a rent stabilization board. Uh, Katie says rent control guidelines for what constitutes a livable home. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and we're going to, we're going to talk about that in a second. Um, Emily says, build affordable housing. It seems like all the new apartment buildings I see going in are luxury apartments. Yeah, um, it's it's frustrating to see. I, I remember a presentation I was at a couple of years ago by the San Diego Housing Federation, so, so not the Housing Commission, um, that showed that we were building like 300% more high income housing uh, than we needed to meet demand. And it's like, everyone has to pay up and pay up and pay up. Yeah. Um, well, feel free to keep those answers coming in the chat or just continue to, to ponder this question, but we'll go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, we're going to start talking about this vision. So habitable and safe housing. So, so housing habitability is, is something, there is a legal definition. Um, in San Diego Civil Code, there's a, a legal definition for what it means to be habitable. And these are just some examples. Um, weatherproofing, um, so we, uh, we had a tenant in Linda Vista, uh, where, where I primarily work, whose roof, they'd been complaining about their roof, um, leaking. And after a rain, their roof literally collapsed onto their bed. Um, so that was not an effectively weatherproofed home, you know, uh, obviously hot and running water and electricity, um, are, these are necessary legal components for, for a habitable home. Um, that a home is structurally strong, you know, it, it's, it's, its floors and walls are, are structurally sound. Uh, a couple of you mentioned um, some environmental hazards, like just being safe to be in that you're not going to get sick from living in your home. Um, that's kind of, yeah, safe housing 101. So no mold, lead or pests um, and locks on the doors, you know, that it's secure. Um, so I th someone mentioned, I'm going to bring up the comment in the, in the chat. Yeah, Katie mentioned that something we need to ensure that is guidelines for a livable home. Well, we have those guidelines, um, but unfortunately, we don't have a system to enforce those guidelines. So currently, if I'm living in a home that uh, lacks weatherproofing, for example, I can make a complaint to code enforcement, and they're supposed to come investigate. Um, but code enforcement in San Diego can call up my landlord and say, hey, you know, Blake complained that his roof is leaking and the landlord can say, oh, I'm working on it, case closed. Well, what, what if a week later he's not working on it and my roof collapses on my head, you know? So that's, that's not a system that's um, really enforcing that landlords meet these basic definitions of habitability. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Housing with affordable and predictable rent. Yeah, so this, uh, this I think, um, reminds me of what Adina was sharing. You know, you want to be able to know that you can afford your rent, um, even if there's a crisis. So the definition that we have of, of housing affordability, and I'm actually a little bit off here, is that rent doesn't cost more than it should be 30% of your monthly income. So that's, that's the metric that, that someone needs to not be considered rent burdened. Um, so... That's not the case for over half of tenants in San Diego. Um, over half of, of tenants in San Diego are paying more than 30% of their monthly income on rent. That's not affordable. Um, and that rent doesn't increase more than people's income. So that's the predictable side of things. Um, what's the current system we have to make sure that rent is, rent is affordable and predictable? We don't have a system to ensure that rent is affordable. Um, good luck. You know, that's why over half of tenants in San Diego are rent burdened because there is no plan um, for affordable rent. The current system to make rent predictable uh, just passed last year statewide, and that's the only protection we have in San Diego. Grace mentioned this, AB 1482. Um, and people, when that passed, a lot of people thought, oh, great, we have rent control. Um, but the AB 1482 is not a rent control bill. It's best understood as an anti-rent gouging act, um, a landlord can still raise rent. Um, this year, it's about 8% per year. And there are many properties that aren't protected by this at all. 
Um, so if my landlord, for example, wants to raise rent 15%, it kind of relies on me to know that that's not allowed and to be able to find a legal resource to enforce that. Um, so currently our system doesn't really have any type of protections to ensure that rent is both affordable and predictable. We'll go to the next slide. Yeah, and I just wanna lift up um, a couple comments in the chat. Uh, Dory is bringing up that every home that, that they've lived in has not met those guidelines but the implicit understanding has been that if those issues were fixed, rent would be raised. Yeah, and that's frustrating. Um, habitability is the bare minimum, you know, that shouldn't be, that should already be factored into your rent, uh, that your home is habitable. Um, John is saying the rent burden, does that include utilities? San Diego is the highest utility rates in the nation. And no, that's just talking about rent. So if you include utilities, that number is probably even higher. Um, and Anais is mentioning, I've noticed that when apartment hunting, yeah, most people ask for proof of income three times the rent amount, which is really, really difficult to provide. Um, protection from eviction. So as Patricia was mentioning, like, and we, we saw her, her sign behind her, no more evictions, right? Um, I think the vision in San Diego is that as long, if you're a tenant living in a home, as long as you're upholding the terms of your lease, as long as you're not you know, breaking laws, you should not be evicted. You know, if you pay your rent, um, if you uphold the terms of your lease, you should, you should never be evicted from your home, you know? Um, so we have just cause in San Diego, which protects people from certain types of evictions, but there's always workarounds. Uh, just cause in San Diego, you need to live in your home for 24 months before you get protect, protected, which is crazy. You know, if you lived in a place for 23 months, what are you not a tenant there? Like, could you don't, you shouldn't have rights. I, I just don't understand how that timeline was, was decided on. And a landlord can, can, I'll just go over one of these examples for a workaround. But if your landlord says, well, I want to substantially remodel this, I need to evict you so I can substantially remodel this property. Um, that is what we've decided is, is all a landlord needs to do to, to evict someone from their home. Um, and technically there's a process that's what they're supposed to go to, to um, you know, the city has to say, oh, okay, this is a substantial remodel. But a lot of times, uh, and we'll get to this in the next slide, um, people don't contest that, especially in San Diego. So if we'll move to the next slide here. Yeah, and so uh, the the last thing per, for part of this vision is just a citywide culture of tenants knowing and exercising their rights. Um, <clears throat> we were working we're working on a uh, a project right now, and someone who does research in LA um, put it like this: in Los Angeles, where a culture of tenant rights and and legal resources exists, when a tenant gets a sixty day notice or a thirty day notice to vacate, their first thought is, "How can I fight this?" And in San Diego, when a tenant gets a notice like this, and this has been my experience working with tenants, is I'll get a phone call from a tenant and they won't say, I got a 30 day notice, how can I fight this? They'll say, I got a 30 day notice. Can you help me find a new apartment? I have to move. Um, so we're not even aware of our rights. As Patricia was mentioning, a lot of people don't know their rights and how to exercise them. And so a vision would be, we have legal resources and tenant organizations who have what they need to educate tenants and connect them to a well-resourced system um, whenever there's an issue with their landlord. So we need to strengthen the laws in place. We need to make just cause stronger. Um, we need to you know, do something to have affordable and predictable rents. Um, but we also need to have a network of support when those things aren't happening to enforce those rights and connect tenants to, to organizations who can help them understand their rights. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. Uh, so what do we need? So here's just a couple examples. Um, we need code enforcement who can impose penalties on landlords who maintain substandard housing. Um, rent control with a rent board to enforce and settle landlord tenant disputes. That helps us ensure that we have housing that's affordable and predictable. Uh, we need stronger just cause protections, just cause meaning your, your landlord needs to have a just cause to evict you, and they need to start from day one. Um, you shouldn't have to live in a place for two years to, to get those protections. And then funding for tenant counseling and legal services for all people. Um, some people are excluded from eligibility because of immigration status. 
Um, and especially in a border region like San Diego, that's unacceptable. Uh, next slide, or is this, this might be the last slide. Okay. Um, so that's just a little bit of an outline. I, I think it's helpful to break it down into those different categories of what we currently have and what we could have to ensure that everyone in San Diego has access to, to both safe and stable housing. Uh, so now I'm going to turn it over to Laura Ann, and she's going to zoom in on what our priorities are for this year, what, what our group is asking for this year to, to help move us in this direction, recognizing that to get all these things is a, is a multi-year fight. So Laura Ann, you can uh, take it away. Forgot to unmute. <laughs> okay. Hi, everyone. Um, nice to be here. Um, thanks so much for attending. What Blake was talking about in terms of especially educating and learning about rights as renters, um, that is the main reason we're doing this presentation. We really want to get the word out to as many renters as possible, to as many people as possible, to as many, um, anybody in this region particularly to know how important it is to know your rights. And that's, that's really the most basic step for how to change and improve things for, for renters and for all people that live here. Um, so these are basically, I'm gonna be going over our four requests that we made this year. Um, we are part of the working group for tenants and housing in tenants rights and housing for the Community Budget Alliance um, for the city of San Diego. So every year we work together um, as a group um, coming from many different agencies. I'm from the City Heights Community Development Corporation and we um, work together and meet regularly to come up with some asks that we can go to city council with and the mayor and ask for that we think will be possible to be maybe passed and definitely will improve um, the situation for tenants particularly. So our first one was um, rental assistance for all. Um, we uh, decided on that during the pandemic, but it was also a request that we had before the pandemic. We knew, but particularly because of the pandemic, this was gonna be something that was very, very important. And um, we were able to get a lot of that, particularly because of the federal government um, giving a lot of money to everyone in the country, all the, the metropolitan areas. So this year we got over 90,000, I think 92, no, sorry, $92 million that we received for um, the city of San Diego. This doesn't include uh, almost another 100, 100 million for the county and um, the city of Chula Vista. So in um, what that means is that this is, this is all money being given out through a new um, bill, through the um, Senate Bill 91, which is what covers um, the allocation of this money for renters um, throughout the state of California in particular. Um, I think some of you know this, but in, in general, it, it covers 80% um, of your rent, back rent, um, but your landlord and your, the tenants have to work together to, the, to do this. Um, not all landlords will do this. And um, sometimes it's difficult for um, people with, well, it, it depends on the landlord and the tenant, but there are some difficult situations, but we are very happy that they were able to give the, um, this much money for um, the city um, for renters. Um, uh, one caveat is that there probably isn't gonna be enough for everyone. Um, but we're hopeful that a lot more people will get assistance because there is um, $92 million this time. Our second ask that was also um, approved um, and agreed upon was to partner with and fund community groups, community organizations to conduct that education and counseling and outreach to tenants and landlords, particularly to get this assistance and particularly for them to learn about how this assistance can be given to pay back rent in particular and to keep people in their homes. So one of the reasons that we asked for this was because um, we found that there was much better um, access for tenants through community groups that work and live in many, all the areas of, of San Diego um, to, for tenants to access than, than in, through the city, particularly the bureaucracy. So this was something else that, that did happen. Uh, I believe there are 10 organizations that are working directly with tenants to help them with applications to get the assistance um, offered by the city. Um, the second two that we have here are both um, requests for um, information. Uh, Blake spoke about um, how we need more information um, and how we need rent control and how we need um, uh, a rent registry so that we can learn about what's going on. One of the big problems in this area is that there is no information 
or very little information about how many people actually are being evicted and where are they being evicted and where, what, who are the landlords that are, are not allowing um, renters to, uh, or not improving the homes for renters. Um, so we need a study to look at what are the problems and what are the, what are the evictions happening? Where are they happening? Who are they happening to? How many? Um, the rental market itself. So there's a lot of information that's needed um, in order to make the policies that will better protect tenants particularly. Um, and that has to happen first. The way the city of San Diego does this for any kind of um, policy change is they ask for a study, which is called a nexus study, to actually analyze and look at these costs and the feasibility and how we can create a rent registry and start collecting information about what's going on for renters, um, particularly around evictions. And then our last request, which is also pending, is um, we are asking for a study on, to on how we can implement a vacancy tax. Um, as Blake alluded to, he talked about the fact that um, there's a lot of uh, buildings and apartments that are being built that are not serving um, the majority of tenants and renters in San Diego. There's also um, businesses that are vacant. So we have um, apartments and businesses and homes that are vacant. And um, by implementing a vacancy tax, they can actually be taxed for not um, opening to, to more tenants. So the idea with this is to say, can we find out how many vacant um, buildings there are here? Can we find out if we can tax them and use that money to provide legal services for tenants and um, help tenants stay in their homes and not be evicted? Um, I think that in general, we all know, um, I probably should have said this earlier, but even before the pandemic, um, there were a lot of problems in San Diego for, for renters. And it's one of the things that we've, we've talked about over and over again here. Um, there was one study that tried to figure out how many um, evictions were happening here. Um, in the county of San Diego, um, the 211 did an estimate that was about 10 evictions a day before the pandemic. Um, as, as Grace explained, we've had a thousand since the pandemic started, but that's actually during a time when there were not supposed to be any evictions. We had an eviction moratorium. And we also know that many people um, have left their homes and have been moved out of their homes um, without a formal eviction, but because they were afraid, because the landlord told them they should leave, because they didn't stay, they didn't have all the education that Patricia has, that she knows her rights, that she doesn't have to leave. So that is happening over and over again. And that is a, a big reason why we know um, these, these changes are needed and this information is very important to gather. Um, I am available to take questions, but I think I'm going to be moving right along to um, Jean-Louis. And Jean-Louis is going to talk about how you can take action, how you can learn and use this information and make San Diego better for you and your family. Thank you. Thank you, Lorian, for a thorough um, walk through the CPA um, demand for the communities. Um, next up, I would ask you guys is there's a link inside your chat is the action link. So if you please can click on that, that would be awesome. I'm gonna share the screen as well to walk you through this. So first off, we have the first action is the emailing the mayor. All you have to do is click on this link and filling out the information super briefly. And then all you have to do is just hit send. And voila, you send an email to our mayor Todd Gloria today, just now. Um, we want to see a lot of those folks just sending emails right now. That would be awesome. Then the next action that I want you guys to do is the social media storm. So you can pick the choose with social media that you want to do either Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. But if you do Facebook or Twitter, all you have to do is to click on the link and you share and then hit continue. That's all you have to do. Super easy and quick, yeah? Now I want you guys to also do that as well. We'll basically make it super simple for folks to um, take action. Okay, 
I see some folks are inside a document. So I'm seeing you're doing it. That's great. But next up is the phone call Ashton. What we're going to do today is super fun. We're going to move all of you into this side. And all of us are going to be making phone call right now to the mayor. So I'm going to add on the panelists, help us move everyone into the panelist event. You get to be on this side. And, and while we're doing this, I'll just explain a little bit more about this action. We'll, we'll put it back on the, uh, the screen in a second so everyone can see it. Um, but the reason we want to, to, to bring everybody over here is not to put you on the spot, not trying to, if you weren't expecting to be on video, that's okay. Um, but in doing a, a phone call to the mayor, which is, it's really powerful. It's one of the ways in which we can use our power um, to elevate our voice and explain to our elected official who was elected to, to lead our city, um, you know, that we're here tonight to support tenants um, and that the situation in San Diego for tenants has never been good um, and it's particularly bad right now. Uh, so we wanted to bring you over here just to have a little bit more strength in numbers. Uh, if you wanna put your camera on, while you're making your phone call, we encourage you to do that. If you're not feeling it, if you weren't expecting to, you know, it's seven o'clock, that's totally fine. Um, but we put the action up on the screen and, and this is just a, a sample, you know, if you, so if you're not sure what to say, um, feel free to use this script that we've developed. If you do want to uh, say something more specific, you know, Patricia gave a perfect example of how this pandemic has impacted her family and their housing. Um, so if you want to incorporate, you know, a, a personal story, please feel free. Uh, you don't need to follow this script a hundred percent. But yeah, so the, the phone, the phone number is on there. And uh, if folks want to turn their camera on and, and make a phone call, please feel free. I, Grace is on the phone, letting the mayor know Jean Hui is about to dial. Um, I'm going to put myself on mute and do the same. Um, but yeah, we can do this together as a, as a way to, to close out and to, to recognize, as, as Patricia said, um, you know, when we lose our fear, uh, they lose our power. So if it's scary, just, just remember that and, and let's reclaim some of our power. Hello, everyone on the phone. Voice leaving a good voicemail. Yes, we're doing yes. it, San Diego. We're doing it. That was really good. Yes. I want to see the folks at home look at a screen share. And also dial that number and also leave the mayor, Todd Gloria, the same message. The more that we do, 
the better it is because he needs to hear from the community. We're taking action today and I'm proud of every single person doing it. What? The mailbox is full? No way. And the technology, the mailbox is full? If you're already? at home or right Just now, try. take a screenshot. Take a screenshot of it and do it tomorrow after they listen to our message. We'll call do again. It. I think, I think it, yeah, call again. So the last item that I want you guys to also join us is to, as you're aware, the CBA have been doing panelists, um, panel events every Tuesday. So there's a bit.ly link in the same document. Please click on it and sign up for our next future event is the people economy. Yeah, we do need to protect our people who the worker. And then also the um, redefining public safety part two, but also, also, please consider to sign up for the rent control teaching. You heard about the need of rent control that we need to have here in San Diego to protect not only renter, I mean, to, to protect all of the renter. Every single solution you see so far, they own patches. We need rent control because that's a long-term solution. So please click on that link right now and sign up for it. It won't let me. What do you but mean? I can't click on it, but I will write it down and go in it. Okay, I will paste it into the chat right now for you. Oh, thank you. No, thank you. Thank you for letting me know. Yes. <laughs> so when you're at home, the link to sign up is bit.ly forward slash mm -hmm. HDR, it means housing, tenant right, underscore signed up. Thank you. Thank you. Take me inside. Yay, yay. All right, well, with that, I wanna thank you everyone for showing up today and listening to our um, Housing Tenant Right Working Group. These folks have been um, doing the work and then you know try to advocate for better change here in, in San Diego and protecting renter. And my, my renter is the, the people that who need the most protection. You hear about homeless issues all the time, but like renter are one step away from being homeless. If you want to curb that end, you also have to fix, you have to also have to worry about that end as well. So for every folks that who are taking action tonight, I appreciate it on the bottom of my heart because you are doing the work and you showing up and keep show up and every Tuesday, this is what we do. Thank you again. And you have a good night. Three, two, three. Oh. Thank you so much.